Good morning, everyone. And happy Sabbath. Thank you for the invitation to share with you this morning. A real joy to be able to be at the Village Church. And it's been a treat to be a part of the Daniel 11 uh, conference taking place this weekend. And that, of course, will continue this morning as well as this afternoon. And, of course, the focus for Daniel 11, we're talking about God's people in the last days. We're talking about prison truth. And so it's a joy to be able to build on that platform. Today, my uh, sermon or study is entitled, A People of Prophecy. Now, let me begin with a short little story. Some of you have probably heard this before. Back in 1874, the members of the little Methodist church in Swan Quarter, North Carolina, decided that it was time for them to build their own church building. So they began to look around town for a piece of land that they could purchase, and they found the perfect piece of land centrally located in the small community, land owned by a Mr. Sam Sadler, and they approached the owner of the property and asked if they could buy his land to build a church. But when Sam Sadler discovered that it was a church that wanted to buy his land, he flatly refused. He felt that such a nice piece of property centrally located in town needed to be sold to a more prominent entity in the community. Even after the congregation raised their offer, he still refused. Finally, they accepted a gift of some land just outside the small town, and they went about building themselves a sturdy little wooden church building. Well, the night of the dedication of their church, a storm blew in. It rained and rained, and the little creek that ran through town became a river that burst its banks and actually flooded the whole town. Now, as the flood waters began to rise, the miracle took place. You see, the little wooden church building was lifted off its foundations, and as if guided by an unseen hand, its little church made its way towards town. It floated down the main street and then stopped and made a sharp right turn. It went for two blocks and then stopped and made a sharp left turn. It went down that street and then stopped right next to a vacant piece of land and it moved itself into the center of the property. Yes, the very land that Sam Sadler had refused to sell to the church. Well, after Sam Sadler heard about this, with trembling hands, he brought the deed of the property to the pastor of the church. And he said, I think God wants you to buy my land for your church. And so they did. The little wooden church was eventually replaced by a brick building, but if you were to visit Swan Quarter, North Carolina, you could actually go visit that very church, and there is a plaque out front that tells you the history of the church moved by the hand of God. It's called the Providence Methodist Church, now Swan Quarter, North Carolina. Well, the reason I share that story with you is because I believe there is another church, another movement that has been raised up by God, that has been moved by God to do a special work in these final moments of earth's history. You see, I believe God has raised up the Adventist movement, the Adventist church, not just another church for people to consider, but God has raised up the Advent movement to proclaim a message that will prepare a holy people to meet a holy God. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a movement of prophecy. There's not too many churches that can trace their beginning to a specific prophecy found in the Bible. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church can do just that. So the subject of our study this morning is Revelation chapter 10. For Revelation chapter 10 describes God raising up a movement whose work it is to proclaim the everlasting gospel. So that's what we're going to be studying together. A little bit of the context here of uh, Revelation chapter 10. So Revelation chapter 9 closes with the sounding of the sixth trumpet. The seventh trumpet does not sound until Revelation 11:15. Thus, Revelation chapter 10 is a prophecy that is inserted between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. So first, the context of Revelation 10. Revelation 10 is between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. Now, when it comes to the time period of the sounding of the sixth trumpet, there is no doubt. You see, the time period of the sixth trumpet ends around August 1840. Why did we say 1840? Well, this is when Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Christian powers of Europe 
If you want to read more about that, take a look at Great Controversy, page 334 and 335. Thus, the time frame for Revelation chapter 10 would begin sometime after 1840, or around that time period. Well, let's begin with the verse itself. And we're going to go verse by verse uh, through the verses we find in Revelation chapter 10. It's not a long chapter, but it is a chapter rich with application and meaning. So it begins this way. And I saw still another mighty angel, John writes, coming down from heaven. The significance of the angel coming down from heaven shows that this prophecy comes from God and is of great importance. The word angel in the Greek literally means messenger, angelos. And not all angels in Revelation are necessarily angelic beings. In Revelation chapter 14, we read about three angels, and they are pictured as taking God's everlasting gospel to the world. And these three angels, as you know, represent God's people in the last days, taking the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So an angel in Bible prophecy means a messenger, not always angelic beings. It can be you and I, but it can even be something more, as we'll see. Speaking of this angel coming down from heaven in Revelation chapter 10, we have a description. It says he's clothed with a cloud, and there is a rainbow on his head. Now, in the Bible, clouds are often associated with God. Exodus chapter 19, verse 9 makes this clear. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud. A rainbow in the Bible is a symbol of God's covenant of mercy. Genesis 9, verse 13, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So this being coming down from heaven, this heavenly messenger, as we look at the description given here, this is not an angel, nor is it God's people, but it is Christ himself bringing a message a heaven-born message to the earth. Now we find here, talking about the rainbow of promise, God's amazing grace, page 157. The rainbow about the throne is the assurance that God is true, that in him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We have sinned against him and are undeserving of his favor, yet he himself was put into our lips that most wonderful of pleas, do not abhor us for thy name's sake, do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not the covenant with us. Then she goes on to explain. She says, He has pledged himself to give heed to our cry. When we come to him confessing our unworthiness and sin, the honor of his throne is at stake in the fulfillment of his word to us. Now, according to Revelation chapter 4, we have a description of the heavenly throne room. God the Father is seated upon the throne. He has in his right hand a scroll sealed with seven seals. But John describes a rainbow surrounding God's throne. The rainbow is a symbol of God's mercy. Oh, how comforting it is to know that when God looks at us, he looks at us through the rainbow of mercy. He's constantly aware of that covenant of blessing. And then verse 1 finishes up, still describing this messenger, this heavenly messenger. His face was like the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus is described as the son of righteousness. He is also pictured as having feet like unto fine brass in Revelation 1, verse 15. This heavenly messenger then is Jesus, the covenant-keeping God, bringing a message of great importance to those who are on the earth. So here in Revelation chapter 10, between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, is a message that is coming to the earth, a message that is brought by Jesus, a message of great importance. And then verse 2 goes on and it says, He had a little book that is open in his hand. So can you picture the scene? Here Jesus, this heavenly messenger, is coming from heaven. He has a message and this message is connected to a little book that is open in his hand. He's directing the people's attention to a little book. Now, of course, what is this little book opening the angel's hand? Well, many believe this to be the book of Daniel, and rightfully so. There are quite a few reasons, but I'll just list four of them. It says the little book here was open at the time of the end. The book of Daniel, of course, was sealed until the time of the end. Daniel 12 was 4. So in Daniel, Daniel is told to seal up the book until 
the time of the end, knowledge shall increase, men shall run to and fro. Now we find in Revelation chapter 10, the little book is open. We've reached the time of the end. Knowledge is being increased in the prophecies of Scripture. Point number two, the little book was opened at the time we did that one. Verse, actually I skipped point number one. It is a little book, and of course, as you know, the book of Daniel is a little book, only 12 chapters. Point number three, the little book contains an oath. The book of Daniel also has an oath, and you can read about that in Daniel 12, verse 7. Point number four, the angel or the heavenly messenger, in this case it's Christ, who made the oath in the book of Daniel is the same person who makes the oath in Revelation 10. You can read about that in Daniel 10, 5 and 6. Also Revelation 1, 14, 15 describes Jesus. And here this heavenly messenger is described in Revelation 10. We're talking about Christ. So the little book, opening the angel's hand, represents the book of Daniel. The one bringing the book, the messenger, is Christ himself. The next part of the verse says, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the land. The sea in Bible prophecy represents a populated area, Revelation 17, 15, and the land then would represent a sparsely populated area. In a geographical context, the sea then symbolizes the old world, the nations of Europe, and the land would symbolize the new world or America. So a couple of things have been established thus far in our study of Revelation 10. Here Jesus is bringing a special message, a heaven-born message. This message has something to do with the little prophetic book of Daniel that was sealed, but now at the time of the end is being unsealed. We also discover the time period for this is sometime after 1840, because it's between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. We also find that this message contained in the book of Daniel is to be proclaimed not only in the old world, in the nations of Western Europe, but in a special sense is also to be proclaimed in the New World, the United States of America, around that same time period, around 1840, 1844. Well, the next verse in verse 3 says, And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. This is Jesus speaking. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. The roar of a lion can be heard over a very long distance. And the message of this heavenly messenger is to proclaim with a loud voice because it's important demands that all listen to it. It involves the eternal destiny of all humanity. Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah who always speaks his message with power. Several times in scripture when God speaks his voice is also like that of thunder. So here we have Jesus having a message connected with a little prophetic book, the book of Daniel. It's between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. It's around 1840. It has to do with a message proclaimed in the new world, in the old world. It is a loud message that all need to hear. And then we move on to verse 4. It says, now, when the seven thunders uttered their voice, I was about to write, John says, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, do not write them down. Now this is particular and interesting verse. Here John in vision hears something. He pulls out his quill and he's about to write it down only to have God say, no, 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 don't, don't write that down. Now we don't know for sure what these seven thunders are. We, we have an idea. They have something to do with certain events taking place prior to the coming of Christ. But specifically what they are, it's not given. So what's the point then of God revealing something only to say, seal it up, don't write it down? Unless there's a lesson in and of that in itself. <clears throat> you see, we get the idea that something is revealed, but it's not fully understood. Thus the experience of those early Advent believers that we're going to be getting to you in just a few moments, as they studied the book of Daniel, there was something about their study that was not fully understood, as if something was held back. Something was not made clear until they had gone through an experience. We'll look at that as we get in here a little bit more. Okay, so like Daniel, long before, John is now bidden to seal up what the seven thunders had done. God in his wisdom withheld the message of these seven thunders, 
Daniel 12, verse 4 says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. When? Time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Specifically, the study of the Word of God, knowledge in the prophecies. Now, of course, fulfilled prophecy is God's unanswerable challenge to unbelief. Revelation chapter 10 is the fulfillment of a unique time prophecy found in the book of Daniel, written over 500 years before the birth of Jesus. To correctly understand Revelation 10, then, we need to consider the significance of this time prophecy found, thank you, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Now, I think us as Adventists, we should be very familiar with this time period, Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Daniel chapter 8, we see a prophecy, and the prophecy has to do with a ram, a goat, a little horn power, and a mysterious time prophecy of 2,300 days. The angel Gabriel then explains to Daniel every detail of the vision except the meaning of the 2,300 days in Daniel 8, 15 through 27. Daniel 9 then records that in answer to prayer, the angel Gabriel returns and instructs Daniel to recall the vision the vision that was unfinished, the explanation of which we read about in Daniel 8. Now the angel comes back, Daniel 9, the angel Gabriel, and explains the time prophecy. The angel Gabriel thus returns and resumes his explanation of the form of vision precisely at the point where it ended that, and had to do with the time prophecy of 2,300 days. Thus the vision of Daniel 9 is a continuation and an explanation of the vision of Daniel 8. So let's get the context. There's a connection here between Revelation 10, the little book in the angel's hand, and a mysterious time prophecy found in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, on 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. An explanation of that time period is not given clearly until, at least the time period itself, until Daniel chapter 9. So it's beginning to come together. Now, all the 2,300 days, is just a little review of Daniel 8, 14. Is it literal or symbolic? We understand it to be symbolic. Three times in Daniel chapter 8, the angel Gabriel states that the prophecy would reach far into the distant future. If the 2,300 days were literal, they would amount to about six and a half years, which would not even reach to the time from Daniel to Christ, let alone to the time of the end. So we know it's not literal 2,300 days. Or you Therefore, it is evident that 2,300 days must be interpreted according to the day for the year principle, which would make it 2,300 years. Let me understand that. There's other verses in Numbers and Ezekiel that make that clear. Next question that we need to ask is, when did the 2,300 days or years begin? Daniel 9:24, the angel says, 70 weeks, 490 years, were to be determined upon Daniel's people, and Daniel's people are the Jews. The word determine means to cut off or measure off or point off. This cutting off must be from some longer period of time. And the only such period referred to in the vision is the 2300 days. Which means then that the two periods must have the same starting point. Amen? So we've got the 2300 days. We've got the 70 weeks, the 490 years. They all have the same starting point. So the starting point for the 70 weeks is specifically given from the decree to go forth and restore and build Jerusalem. The event must also then mark the beginning of the 2300 days. Following the Babylonian and the Persian captivities of Israel, there were three historic edicts by Persian kings which authorized the return of the Hebrews to their homeland. The first decree was of Cyrus in 536 BC, and this allowed for the rebuilding of the temple, the sacred vessels being placed in the temple and temple worship restored. The second decree, that of Darius 519, this decree was a renewal of the previous decree made necessary because the enemy, God's people, attacked and hindered the work of rebuilding. But the third decree, and the one that is most significant to us as Adventists, is of course the decree by Artaxerxes in 457 BC. That's the date. This decree was the most important for it reestablished the Jews as a nation. It provided for the complete restoration of the Hebrew state with full powers of local government. The actual text of this royal decree, which went into effect in the seventh year of Artaxerxes' reign, is given in Ezra 7, and that the seventh year of Artaxerxes' reign was in 457 BC. So we have a solid starting point 
for the 2300 days and the 490. It is evident then the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem could not go into effect according to the prophecy until the comprehensive decree of Artaxerxes in the autumn of 457 BC. Thus having established the starting point of the 2300 days, the rest is simple calculation, 2,300 full years from 457 extends to the year 1843. However, since there is no zero when going from BC to AD, the decree of Artaxerxes did not go into full effect until the autumn of 457 BC, 2,300 years, which ends in the autumn of 1844. And puts us exactly where we need to be to look at Revelation 10, which is inserted between the fifth and the sixth trumpet. So, of course, here we have a very familiar prophecy, and hopefully you have studied this prophecy in depth. The decree, 457 BC, you have Christ being anointed at his baptism, 27 AD. You have the crucifixion, 31. You have the stoning of Stephen in 34. And then you have the 1,810 years that ends in 1844. So Revelation chapter 10, talking about the angel coming down from heaven with the little book that is unsealed in his hand, is a connection to the 2300 days of Daniel 8 verse 14, and there is something that is to happen at the end of that time period, referred to as the cleansing of the sanctuary, and we're going to look at what exactly that means here in just a minute. So verse 5 says, The angel whom I saw standing upon the sea and upon the land raised his hand towards heaven. Now, as it is in our day, so it was in Bible times, the lifting of the hand towards heaven was a gesture characteristic of uttering an oath. It's interesting to note that both the angel of Daniel 12 verse 7 and the angel of Revelation 10 verse 5 raise their hands and make an oath by him who lives forever and ever. So the oath is made by Christ himself. Verse 6 says, And swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things that are there in the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time or delay no longer. Notice here, the oath by him who lives, by him who created the heavens, the earth, and the sea, the first angel's message, worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Here the angel or the heavenly message is Jesus and he swears by the one who lives forever. In other words, Christ makes an oath appealing to his own authority for he is the creator. And Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 puts it this way, For when God made a promise with Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So the phrase delay no longer literally can be translated time no more shall be. What time is this prophecy referring to? Is it literal time? Probationary time or prophetic time? Well, can it be literal time? It cannot be literal time because it talks about for the end of the prophecy, John is told to prophesy again about or before many peoples and nations and tongues. If it were the end of literal time, there would be no need for John to prophesy again. Could it be Probationary time. No, it can't be probationary time because at the end of the prophecy, John is told to measure the people of God and the temple and the altar, which takes place before the close of probation and the second coming of Christ. Thus, our only option with reference to the end of time here, this must be prophetic time. In the book of Daniel, there are four prophetic time periods that are given that have a definite starting point and a definite ending point. And they are as follows. You have the three and a half prophetic years from 538 to 1798. You have the 1290 from 508 to 1798. You have the 1335 from 508 to 1843, 1844. And I'm going to be talking about these time periods in detail. Then, of course, you have the 2300 days from 457 all the way through to 1844. So here we've established this time period. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Verse 7 says, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished, as he is declared unto his servants the prophets. So notice, the angel coming down from heaven has a little book that's open in his hand, and he lifts his hand towards heaven and swears by him who lives forever and ever that there should be time or delay, delay no longer. But when the seventh trumpet begins to sound, meaning the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the mystery that God has revealed in the little book, the book of Daniel, it'll be made clear. It will be 
revealed. Now, this is interesting. The sounding of the seventh angel, we found this announcement in Revelation chapter 11, 15 through 19. Now, if you have your Bibles, let's just go to that for a minute. Revelation is the passage, Revelation chapter 11, and we'll be looking here in verse 15. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. We're looking at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Revelation 11, verse 15. It says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So when the trumpet sounds in heaven, there is a declaration that the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord. And it says, And he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones, they fell on their faces and they worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. So that's what's happening in heaven at the signing of the seventh trumpet. But what's happening on earth at the signing of the seventh trumpet? Verse 18. It says, the nations were angry. That's what's happening on the earth. And your wrath has come, that ultimately is fulfilled in the outpouring of the seven last plagues. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, there isn't a judgment occurring during this time. And you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. When are the saints rewarded? At the second coming. Those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. That is the destruction of the wicked at the second coming of Christ. And all of this is given in verse 19 in the context, now back to heaven. It says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. So when the seventh angel begins to sound, we enter into a special time in heaven where Christ is involved in a work of judgment which shall conclude with the kingdoms of this earth being given to Christ. Jesus then removes his priestly robe. He puts on his kingly robe. Probation closes. The plagues fall. And Jesus comes as King of kings and Lord of lords to deliver his people to judge the wicked. So, Revelation chapter 10 says, when the seventh trumpet begins to sound, you know that occurs at the end of the 2300 days when the sanctuary begins to be cleansed. A mystery will be revealed and that mystery has to do with a work of cleansing, a work of judgment that is to take place in the heavenly sanctuary. Wait, there's more. Daniel chapter 7. Go with me to Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. I think this makes it even clearer. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. Talking about the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Daniel 7 verse 9. Daniel says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Now, who is the Ancient of Days described in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9? We know that to be God the Father. Why? Because we find Jesus being described a little further, and there he's described as the Son of Man. It says, the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, representing purity and wisdom. His throne, a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So here we find the same event described at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. This is the beginning of the pre-avent or the investigative judgment here described in Daniel. So here we find the Ancient of Days, that is God the Father, who moves from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary into the most holy place. The stage is set for the judgment. The Ancient of Days takes his seat. The books of record are opened. But then something else is described as taking place. Look over here in verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold... One like unto the Son of Man. Now, who's that? That's Jesus. Notice the next part of the verse. It says, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, when you read that verse, you might think, ah, we're talking about the second coming of Jesus. Because isn't it true that when Jesus comes the second time, he's coming with the clouds of heaven? And who are the clouds of heaven? 
represents angels. But this is not talking about the second coming of Christ because notice Jesus is not coming to the earth here, but where is he going? Verse 13, And behold, one like unto the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So this is not Jesus coming to the earth at the end of the 2300 days. This is Jesus following the Father from the holy place into the most holy place. There is a work of judgment, a work of cleansing to take place. And at the conclusion of that work of cleansing, verse 14, Then to him, that's Jesus, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples and nations should serve and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, his kingdom one which shall not be destroyed. So at the conclusion of this work of judgment, this cleansing, this mystery of God being revealed, as declared to Daniel the prophet, the kingdoms of this world are given to Jesus, and Jesus comes then as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the context. So in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished, as he has declared unto his servants the prophets. Now at the beginning of this time period, referred to as the seventh trumpet, which begins in 1844, the mystery of God will be revealed. What is the mystery of God? Paul states that the mystery of God is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. During then this time of judgment, the character of God in a special way will be revealed to the world through his people. Revelation chapter 18 verse 1 describes the fourth angel coming down from heaven. The earth is illuminated with his glory and he cries mightily with a strong voice. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And after the message is given with power, then another voice is heard from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. So the fourth angel, Revelation chapter 18, which has the message of the second angel, the difference being the fourth angel proclaims with a loud voice, it is a revelation of God's glory, a revelation of God's character through his people. The mystery of God is being revealed. Also, you see the pre-advent message described for us here in Matthew 22. We don't have time to go into the depths of that parable, but it's a fantastic study. If you have time, take a look at it. But just in brief... Matthew 22 it talks about a king that has a marriage arranged for his son. Now in, a, in the Bible parable, when you have a king and he has a son that's getting married, you know the king represents the father, the son represents Jesus, and the marriage represents Christ's reception of his kingdom, his bride, the kingdom made up of you and I, the citizens, the church. And those who were first invited to come to the wedding, they rejected the invitation. Until finally their kingdom was destroyed, their capital, their city was destroyed. It's talking about the Jewish people who rejected the invitation. And finally the Romans in 70 AD destroyed their city. But then the message went to the highways and to the byways. Now the gospel invitation is going to the Gentile nations. And finally people are gathered into this banquet hall, both good and bad. And then it says a time comes. If you want to put a time on that, it's 1844. When the king enters the hall and he is examining the guests. And the king comes in and he's looking at the guests and he sees there a man who is not wearing the wedding garment. He's clothed in his own clothes. And the king comes and says to him, how is it that you came hither not wearing the wedding garment? And the man is speechless. He's got no excuse. Why? Because he had been given the wedding garment at the door, but he refused to put it on. He felt like his own robe was clean enough. And the king says, bind him hand and foot, throw him outside. Now we know that this parable in Matthew 22 is talking about an event that must take place before Jesus comes. Isn't that correct? Is anybody going to be thrown out of heaven after Jesus comes? No. So this examining of the guests described in Matthew 22 is a reference to the pre-advent or the investigative judgment. Jesus describing a time when the king comes in to see the guests. We're living in that time today. When the examination of the guests is complete, then Jesus says, he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Probation closes. Christ's high priestly ministry ends. He begins his kingly ministry. The plagues fall and he comes as king of kings and lord of lords. We're living during that time when the mystery of God is to be revealed. 
The verse goes on and says, the angel, in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and upon the earth, now of course the historical experience being described here, John here represents those to whom this prophecy symbolizes, and that would be the Millerite movement of 1840 to 1844. William Miller, an American Baptist preacher, is credited with beginning the religious movement known as militarism, or Millerism, I should say. Following his conversion, he began a careful and systematic study of the Bible. Although the Bible, although the, the Bible to interpret itself for itself, that's the principle he used, he came to the understanding that one prophetic day equals one literal year, and using this principle, he calculated the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14, to be 2,300 literal years, ending in 1843-1844. Now at first, Miller was reluctant to share what he had learned, for, for he was not an eloquent speaker. But finally, in August of 1831, he accepted an invitation to speak on the prophecies of Daniel in the town of Dresden, New York. This was the first of thousands of sermons and lectures by Miller on the prophecies of Daniel over the next 13 years. In 1832, a Baptist newspaper published a series of articles written by Miller on the prophecies of Daniel. Shortly after this, other religious newspapers and magazines also began publishing Miller's writings and quickly his articles and printed lectures spread across America and to many of the nations of Europe. This awakened much interest in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and soon became the foundation of the great Advent revival of the early 1840s all the way through to 18. 44. Verse 9 says, So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. John now acts a part of those who participated in this Millerite movement of 1840 to 1844. Based on their study of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, those involved in the movement interpreted the cleansing of the sanctuary to mean the cleansing of the earth with fire at the second coming of Jesus. Thus they concluded that Jesus would return at the end of the 2300 days or years, in 1844. They ate the little book. It was in their mouth sweet as honey, but when Jesus did not come, the little book, once so sweet, made their belly bitter. Jeremiah chapter 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Though mistaken in expecting Christ to return in 1844, they nevertheless were led by God and found the message of the near advent precious to their souls. Their calculation of the time element in Daniel 8.14 was correct, but they were mistaken as to the nature of the event that was to take place at the end of the 2300 days. The sanctuary of Daniel 8.14 refers to the heavenly sanctuary, for in 1844 no earthly sanctuary existed. So they were correct in their time calculation, but what was to happen at the end of the time period, that's where they were somewhat confused. Now, we shouldn't be too hard on the early Millerite or Advent believers. You see, the Millerite believers, like the disciples, had the wrong expectation concerning the establishment of Christ's kingdom of glory. The disciples expected Jesus to establish his kingdom of glory at his first coming, and the Millerite believers expected the Christ's kingdom to be established at the end of the 2300 days. Even though the disciples had the wrong expectation, they were still Christ's disciples. So it was with the Millerite believers. Even though they, their expectation was incorrect, they were still his people, and he was leading them into a clearer understanding of his word. And to 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now, what is this cleansing of the sanctuary? Now, this is coming close to home. This is not just history. This is talking about our experience now. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? Well, there are two parts. First of all, there is a cleansing that has to take place on earth. This will be accomplished through the proclamation of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, which will prepare a people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, when you study the Bible, you find a reference to five sanctuaries or temples. You've got the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is ministering as a high priest. That's the heavenly. You've got the earthly sanctuary. In the earthly sanctuary, I'm talking about the one that Moses built in the wilderness. I'm talking about the one that Solomon built. I'm talking about the one that was rebuilt after the seven years of Babylonian captivity. The one that was destroyed in 70 AD. That's all the earthly. 
So you have the heavenly sanctuary, you've got the earthly sanctuary. The earthly was the shadow of the heavenly. But there are three other sanctuaries spoken of in Scripture. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. What was Christ talking about? He's talking about his body. That's the third. And then the Bible tells us, know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's the fourth. And the fifth, the New Testament tells us that we are living stones built together on the chief cornerstone Christ. The church is the temple of God in the earth today. And there is a work of cleansing. This work of cleansing in the heavenly sanctuary is reflected by a work of cleansing in God's church today. A work of cleansing in the hearts and the minds of God's people on earth. You understand? So this cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is not just a work that happens there independent from us, but as the cleansing is happening in heaven, there is a cleansing happening in our hearts and in our minds. You understand? And what's the end result of this cleansing that takes place in heaven, this cleansing that takes place in the hearts and the minds in the church? The mystery of God is being revealed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this work of cleansing, friends, is happening right now. We're invited to be part of the revealing of the mystery of God, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And when the character of God is reproduced in his people, the loud cry will go forth, the earth will be illuminated with his glory, and Jesus will come to claim his people as his own. There is a work of cleansing. Now, of course, we don't have time to go into the details of Revelation 14. I hope you understand the three angels' messages. Fear God. Give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come. Worship the Creator, the one who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Babylon is fallen. He's fallen. Don't worship the beast in His image. Don't receive His mark in the forehead or in His hand. The shame shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The most fearful warning you can find anywhere in the Bible is don't worship the beast in his image. Now the first angel's message is proclaimed with a loud voice. The third angel's message is proclaimed with a loud voice. The second angel though in Revelation 14 simply announces the fall of Babylon. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Thus you have the fourth angel in Revelation chapter 18 which repeats the message of the second angel but has great power. The earth is illuminated with his glory. He says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hated bird, and a message is heard from heaven come out of her, my people. Second Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about establishing believers in what he calls present truth. And in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is giving a parable, and he talks about a certain householder, and he had servants, and the wise servants are the ones who were giving the household meat in due season. That is present truth. So there is a present truth message that needs to go to the church. There is a present truth message that is to be proclaimed to the world. The present truth message has something to do with the high priestly ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. It's a message that has to do with the cleansing in the hearts and the lives of God's people and the proclamation of the three angels' messages that will prepare a living generation to meet a holy God. The Advent Church is a movement of prophecy called to do a special work in these final moments of earth's history. So we spoke about the cleansing happening in the earth. Of course, there's the cleansing in heaven. This work began when Jesus entered his final phase of judgment as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary at the end of the 2300 years. The books of record of all professed followers of Christ were opened for examination. And when this judgment work ends, the confessed sins of God's people will be blotted out eternally from the heavenly books of record, thus cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, and thus God's people will be cleansed on earth. Probation will close. Jesus will come. Now notice these two verses. There are many, but there are two in particular that I think summarizes our experience and this work of cleansing. Don't miss these. Zechariah 39. Notice what the prophet says. God speaking through the prophet, I will bring one third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. That's a reference to a judgment. They will call on my name and I will answer them. 
I will say, this is my people, and each one of them will say, the Lord is my God. A time of cleansing, a time of refining, a time of judgment. Malachi chapter 3, beginning verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Notice this. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. It's not talking about the second coming of Christ. But this is talking about the messenger of the covenant, this is Jesus, entering into his temple, into his final phase in that heavenly sanctuary, this work of judgment, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom I delight. Behold, he's coming, saith the Lord of hosts. And what happens? But who can endure the day of his coming? For, he, for who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and as a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, that is his chosen people, and purge them as gold and silver that they might offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. To offer an offering in righteousness is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there's a work of cleansing, a work of purifying so that we can offer an offering acceptable to God, Christ in us, Verse 4, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. Verse 11, finishing up the chapter. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again about or before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Though John eating of the book, eating the book had ended in bitterness, he was told to prophesy again. As the full meaning of the three angels' messages dawned upon the early Advent believers, they came to realize that their work had not ended in 1844, but it had scarcely begun. Now, what does the cleansing of the sanctuary mean for us personally? It means that the great heavenly day of atonement has begun, and Jesus is now performing his final ministration on behalf of sinners. We must therefore send our sins beforehand to the judgment. We must abide in Christ on a moment-by-moment -moment basis so that when the final decisive hour comes for us personally, we will be found in him. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24 talks about sending our sins beforehand to the judgment. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 talks about abiding in Christ. Philippians 3, 9, the same theme. Now, verse 11. I just want to read verse 1 of Revelation chapter 11. Of course, you understand that the original divisions that we have in Revelation, John didn't write chapter 11, chapter 10. That came later on. And the first verse, the first three verses, but the first verse in particular of chapter 11 has special significance to Revelation 10 because notice what it says. He says, I was given a reed like unto a measuring rod. Now the word read in the Greek, kana, which is also where we get the English word canon, which means rule or law or standard. In religion, we speak of the canon of scripture, the Bible, which is the standard used in the judgment. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for God will bring every work into judgment. And the angel said, stand and ri rise and measure the temple of God. To measure the temple of God is a reference to the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary spoken of in Daniel 8.14. To measure the altar is a reference to the prayers of the saints. The prayers of professed Christians are evidence of whether or not they are genuinely converted. Now please don't miss this. This is significant. When John is told to measure the temple of God and those that worship therein, an article of furniture is specifically brought to view. And that is the altar of incense. And we know that the altar of incense symbolizes the prayers of the saints. What is it that God is looking at in particular during this work of cleansing or this work of judgment? He is considering the prayers of the saints. The prayers is a revelation of the heart of the people of God. If our prayers are sincere and earnest, if we are seeking for a cleansing from sin, if we're asking for Christ to be reproduced within us, it'll be manifest in our prayers. If we are neglecting to pray, or if our prayers are simple, superficial prayers, they don't get to the heart of the matter, those prayers will be measured and found lacking.
in the judgment. Do you understand? The prayers of the saints. Now notice this verse, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. This is an amazing verse. But the end of all things is at hand. We're talking about this time period here, this work of cleansing. He says, therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. You understand the importance of sincere, earnest, heartfelt prayers in the context of the judgment? Very important talks about those who worship therein. This is, of course, a reference to the investigative judgment and those who profess faith in Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 4, 17, For the time has come where judgment will begin at the house of God. John chapter 4, verse 23, But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Evangelism, page 119, in conclusion. In a special sense, Ellen White says, Seventh-day Adventists have been said in the world, as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages, there is no other work of so great an importance they are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Revelation chapter 10 describes the people that have been raised up by God who are going through a work of cleansing and who are called to proclaim a message. Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. This is the everlasting gospel that goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. You see, friends, we're a people of prophecy, raised up by God, prophesied of Scripture. And you know, to me, it's just amazing, around 1844, when the Millerite believers, the early Advent believers, they read Revelation 10, but as if it was hidden from their understanding, they didn't understand that until after the Great Disappointment. And we don't know specifically who it was. We know Hiram Edson brought to view the understanding of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the work of Jesus, but we are not told for sure who it was that was reading Revelation 10, and they stopped and they went, oh, that's us, Revelation 10. The little book, sweet in the mouth, bitter in the stomach. We don't know who it was, but they began to see themselves fulfilled in Revelation chapter 10. And as they read, they were inspired, and they began to realize we must prophesy again to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. See, friend, the Adventist church, the Advent movement is not just an accident. It is a movement raised up by God to do a special work Friends, we are never to forget that. We are not just another Protestant denomination. We're not part of the ecumenical movement. We have been raised up to be unique, to be pointed, to be clear, and to have a message that will prepare people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? May we be faithful to the work that God has called us to do.